Remain seated, please. Permanecer sentados, por favor. Happy National Roller Coaster Day, everyone. I was actually planning on doing a video that was sort of a parody of various theme park reviewers I watch and making a video where I'd review fictional theme parks as if they were real. I tried a similar joke teasing the eventual review of Wonder Park I wanted to do, but that never happened. And then I kind of remembered that people don't really watch any of my videos about theme parks, so... Let's go back to talking about the ghost of Molly McGee. At the end of the episode, Davenport's On Demand, it was teased that Bismart, a big box store, would be moving into Brighton. Brighton looks like a promising location for our next mega store. This would be really bad for the local economy, since big box stores are really good at putting small businesses in small towns out of business. And so, Mayor Brunson bans them from ever building a store in Brighton. Okay, apparently nothing prevents them from building a megastore eight inches outside our beloved Brighton. Which is actually a real thing that happened in Bob Roth's hometown. As I said in the recap video, I kind of thought that the Bismarck CEO would be a pretty uninteresting antagonist in comparison to the much more fun Chen family and much more petty Jinx. Which is why I'm glad that the show went in the direction it did. Bob said, At the end of Demand, it's clear he's going to be trouble. In Demise, he is, and he's so powerful the fight is over before it's begun. Life is like that sometimes. To us, the interesting story was how Andrea deals with that kind of devastating, world-shaking defeat. So let's take a step back and talk more about Andrea. Andrea spent her whole life being a small town celebrity and influencer as the daughter of the town's most successful businessman. You know those local commercials where people involve their kids? Cause we want a Sia and a Kia. Orlando Kia, east, west, and north. For the best in clothing, beauty, and sports, spend your money at Davenport. Yeah, that's Andrea. Pushing the family brand is so important to her identity, and everything else she does is in service of her status as an influencer. And when you think about that in the context of her actions in the first episode, it actually makes a lot of sense. Her name is her brand, to the point where she'll get really, really mad if you get it wrong. It's fairly obvious when you watch the first batch of episodes that Andrea was originally meant to be a much more one-dimensional, snobby, rich girl bully character before the writers decided that it would be way more fun if Andrea was less antagonistic and more likable. Tammy in The Unnatural was originally supposed to be Andrea before things changed. But First Day Frights wouldn't really work if Andrea wasn't giving Molly enough of a hard time for it to be considered bullying. And in that episode, Libby says this. Hey, in the first grade, there was a girl named Libby. She was bright-eyed and full of promise, until one day, she called Andrea, Andrea. And from that moment on, she was an outcast, forever shunned from respectable society. What happened to her? Oh, well, she's me. I'm Libby. And don't get too close. I think I've almost got her worn down. Looking good, Andrea! So it's not surprising that people will take this to mean that Andrea actively bullied Libby for a long time. But I don't think that's actually the case. Andrea just didn't think much about Libby one way or another for most of the time they knew each other. I was unclear on why Libby was invited to the third grade sleepover, but Bob said it was because Andrea's mom forced her to invite everyone, and the incident only served to solidify Libby's status as an outcast. But I think it also just didn't help that Libby was this shy, eccentric kid obsessed with turtles and conspiracy theories. As Molly's relationship with Andrea grew stronger, so too did Andrea's relationship with Libby. Because Molly and Libby don't care about Andrea's status as an influencer, and as a result, they're the first real friends she's ever had. Now, Andrea's grown to realize that social media cloud and family legacy isn't the only thing that's important, but that doesn't mean it's not still super important to her. Andrea believes that her whole future is at risk at this point. I was gonna spend the next 20 years starting a skincare line, a charity for dogs with dandruff, a whole global lifestyle company! Then, I'd marry Alina Webster. Her parents own Webster's department store in Mewline, and she's like really good at market analysis. We'd merge our stores and become the ultimate Midwest power couple. Wow, you are really good at photo editing. Yes, I love this. It's super sweet and casual. I think it's so great. And I still think it's hilarious that this was spoiled by Chibi Tiny Tales. LGBTQ rep for the win! Also, I'm not gonna focus on recapping this part, but the whole B-plot where Scratch is asking people if he has a rock and roll personality is just comedy gold. Do I have a rock and roll personality? <laughs>
Oh, you're serious. There we go, Pondreas. An easy 337 step, no makeup makeup look. Make sure to follow, like, and subscribe, because I really need your support. <laughs> Love you, bye. Andrea, that was great. You've totally found your new brand. <laughs> Let's see if the Pondreas are as obsessed as you are. Weird, no Davenport's content. I wonder what's up with that. So let me get this straight. People are actually upset that Andrea isn't shamelessly promoting the local department store, the one that most of her followers don't even live by and don't know is going out of business? This would be like people who watch Jack's films being upset if he stopped advertising for Audible. Audible stands for, hey you dope, it's a book life, enjoy it. Okay, actually those were pretty funny. Um, no, this would be like people who watch Smosh getting mad that they stopped doing ads for Hot Pockets. All right, high school, here we come. Whoa, what's with the Hot Pocket sandwich? It's my lunch. Whoa, it's hot. No, you know what is hot? My friggin' leather shorts. But I guess that just goes to show how integral to her brand identity the Davenport's brand was. I also want to talk about how great this show is at portraying internet culture as a whole. It's especially difficult to talk about internet culture in animation because things change so fast and animation takes a long time to make. You have to wonder if TikTok will even still be relevant anywhere from 18 months to 3 years later. And even if the site stays around, the trends are always changing. I didn't hate Ralph Breaks the Internet as much as some people did, and I think there's things it did well, but it still has a very surface level understanding of how the internet actually works. The Emoji Movie, on the other hand, is an irredeemable garbage fire. Although, let's be honest, the Emoji Movie isn't a movie, it's an advertisement. And they talk about the internet and smartphones like they're perfect inventions with no downside. And don't even get me started with the ending where Gene turns into a gif emoji and the girl, the kid with the phone is crushing on his leg. I like that you're one of those guys who can actually express his feelings. He sent you a f***ing gif! I think another thing a lot of writers get wrong that Molly McGee's writers thankfully avoid is the idea that all kids are mindlessly addicted to technology and the internet in lieu of actually interacting with other people. In reality, most kids still love going out with their friends and having fun. Phones and social media just make it easier to stay connected with people you know and even make friends with people who share common interests who don't live near you. It's called social media for a reason. And on that note, it's not just kids and millennials who use cell phones and social media. Literally everyone does. Not to say that social media addiction doesn't exist, because in Dance Dad Revolution, we see exactly that and how people can become obsessed with internet fame. The internet is basically just whatever you make of it, and Davenport's and Demise shows just how futile trend chasing can be. She is clearly heaven and I Andrea keeps trying different things, and none of them work. And ultimately, she just feels defeated. You know, most 13-year-olds don't have their whole lives figured out. I know, but I did. And now I don't know what I'm gonna do or who I'm supposed to be. My future is a hot mess. Just like me. Andrea, I'm 26, and I definitely still don't have my life figured out yet. <gasps> oh no, oh no, we were alive that whole time. Oh no, I'm so sorry. The, the empathy part of my brain overpowered the press the stop button part of my brain. It doesn't matter anyway, Molly. My brand is garbage. Who'd want to follow me? These comments. No, Andrea, don't read them. It's not worth it. <gasps> Molly, look. Love this honesty. So real and vulnerable. A ferret can be yours in less than three clicks. Okay, well, that's a bot. I'm gonna... I'm gonna block that one, but everyone else is being really nice. Man, this episode... I was not expecting this episode to hit me as hard as it did. As a kid, I always loved making stuff. I'd mess around with PowerPoint and Windows Movie Maker. In middle school and part of high school, I'd make dumb videos with my friends or my siblings. We'd try to make an intentionally dumb horror movie or make our own version of a Smosh sketch or Tom Scott sketch. I made stuff for my video production class, which ultimately led to what was probably my biggest claim to fame in high school, the Phineas and Ferb Staffers. Staffer, noun, a short made for the school morning announcements where the teacher of the week is picked at the end of it and they get a primo parking spot right up front. 
And the coolest thing that came from this is I actually became friends with Phineas and Ferb co-creator Jeff Swampy Marsh. It appears that Mr. Keston is up to no good again. He's been seen buying up tons of computer equipment. This could be totally harmless, but nothing's certain. Find out what he's up to. Still one of the absolute grooviest dudes on the planet, by the way. I also found out around this time that there were people doing theme park videos. And not just vlogs, I mean scripted videos shot on location at theme parks. So I finally threw out the awful Yellow Crane Productions name I had come up with in middle school in favor of Theme Park Backlot. I made a handful of videos using this style and then COVID hit. I tried making some at home vlogs and I ultimately gave up on doing that. At this point I realized that the Theme Park Backlot show was going to be on hiatus for a while so I rebranded again to Starport 97. I made a video talking about the Phineas and Ferb episode Act Your Age that ended up absolutely blowing up. Until last week, it was the most successful video I'd ever made. Then I thought I'd follow in the footsteps of my friend Tony Goldmark and do a podcast, which was fun and I enjoyed making it, but it never really got the kind of traction I was hoping it would. Even recently, when I did episodes with Bill and Bob as well as Alan Lee, I just don't think I ever found an audience. Then I had the idea to do a compilation video, which was actually inspired by Kayla Heaven's Moon Girl Once Said video on Twitter. And something happened. My video actually started gaining a pretty good amount of traction. So I made more videos about Scratch, Libby, Andrea, and so on. And of course, this was when I realized another rebrand was most definitely in order, since if you didn't know that Starport 97 was a Space Mountain reference, you'd just be like, huh? What? But I still wanted it to be theme park related. And then it hit me. Sunnyland! And my very awesome friend Amelia Blackwell made some sweet artwork reminiscent of the classic Disneyland sign. I also started doing scripted videos, soon leading to my In Defense of Ollie Chen video, which is still one of my favorites. And of course, the three videos that, if you're watching my channel right now, there's like a 50% chance you found me because of them. The Cultural Rep video, the Period Piece video, and the LGBTQ Rep video. But why am I bringing all of this up? Well, because I think this episode brings up a really important point about content creation. What's really amazing about YouTube and TikTok is that anyone can be a creator. Literally anyone can do this. We all have HD or even 4K camcorders in our pockets and international distribution at our fingertips. You don't need a big studio to make a movie, you can just go make your movie. And sure, you can try chasing trends forever. You can see something someone else is doing and think, hey, I can do that. And really, most of trying to make it as a content creator on the internet is just throwing stuff at the wall until something sticks. But what's important is that while you're doing that, you're authentically you. <gasps> That's it! Your new brand is you! Just being you! Well, this means my flawless future is still possible! <gasps> Thanks, Molly! Follow me, Fondress, for more completely unscripted, totally authentic moments like this. And I think that's where I found the most success with this channel. So I want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for 6,000 subscribers. Thank you all so much for taking the time out of your day to watch these videos I make about these shows that I love. How'd it go? You know, pretty good. Is that my jacket? I don't need your validation. I'm rock and roll, baby. Woo. <laughs> so taking my things is rock and roll now? Yep, and I'm taking the pie too. The Ghost and Molly McGee. I could roll personality. Oh, God, no. But that's why I married you. Mm -hmm.